Your word, O oh Lord, is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Amen. You and I might be better off thinking less about what parables mean and more about what they do. At least, according to Amy Jill Levine, professor of New Testament and Jewish studies at Vanderbilt Divinity School, and affiliated professor at the Center for the Study of Jewish-Christian Relations at Cambridge, she wrote that in her recent book, Short Stories by Jesus, The Enigmatic Parables of a Controversial Rabbi. You and I might be better off thinking less about what parables mean and more about what they do. Last Thursday night, I went to Holy Spirit, which is this little outside-the-box midweek congregation that meets in Atwater Village. Knowing that I would be here with you all this Sunday morning, I had had the parable that we just heard which Ralph Waldo Emerson once called the greatest story in all the Bible. I'd had that simmering all week. And at Holy Spirit, I saw what a parable does. And the practice there is for an assigned person to come and offer a short reflection on the scripture, and then it's kind of a free-for-all. Everybody jumps in. And what this story about this man and his two sons did was provoke us to tell our stories, our stories of being separated and alienated and hurt and lost and coming home. So one, one fellow told how he went off to college and flunked out after one semester. And after a series of restarts and yet more failures, he finally called his mother and asked, could he come home? And would she help him get a job in the company where the rest of the family worked? Of course, she said, and paid for his airline ticket. Then another described how he became estranged from a beloved aunt and uncle and when he got word from his sister that his aunt was dying, he jumped on a plane and went straight from the airport to her hospital room where his uncle met him with his arms outstretched. Still another talked about his good friend who has been a tireless and faithful worker repeatedly passed over in favor of younger sons. He's now up for an exciting new position. I used to know what to say to him, but I don't anymore, this fellow said. I'm so afraid for him of one more crushing disappointment. A woman who was raised in the Protestant work ethic and has always given her all said that when she hears this story, she aches for the firstborn the one nobody remembered to invite to the party, and struggles with how unfair that seems, and then grieves because she struggles. And I, well, I've always been the good daughter who tried to keep my nose clean and please my parents. This time around, though, I'm a little unsettled because this time I'm identifying with the second born, that fritterer, that wastrel, the con artist who, after trading on his father's generous and indulgent heart, failed spectacularly to the point where coming home was his only option. Which made me wonder, surprise, surprise, if maybe I intended to draw the lines a little too sharply in this story and moved a little too quickly to interpretation and application. I mean, Jesus doesn't tell us why 
the younger brother decided he needed to leave. What if it was because he hated high school and wanted to get far away where nobody knew him, where he could change his name and become somebody different? Or what if it was because he felt like he was a square peg in a round hole and that the last thing he wanted to do was punch the proverbial time clock until his dad kicked the bucket and then take over the family business with his older brother, of all people. What if he was desperate for freedom, dying literally to take that leap into the unknown, but still smart enough to hedge his bets to get early what he was going to get eventually so he'd have a safety net, even though he ripped a huge hole in it anyway. And you all may be thinking, well, she's being a little imaginative. Well, the seminary word is eisegesis, where exegesis is the art of pulling out what is in there, out of the text. Eisegesis is putting what is out here into the text. And yes, you could say that's what I'm doing. Or, maybe, that's what this parable is doing to me. Amy Gillivine says that parables aren't simple allegories or morality tales, often to the church's dismay. Rather, they are designed to remind, provoke, refine, confront, disturb. So then it occurred to me that if the prodigal is pushing me to wonder about his inner motivations, what might these other two characters in this parable be up to? So let's look at Dad. I know, typically he's seen as the God figure and that's last. But since there would be no story without him, and the first scene is between him and his second son, he needs to be up next. So this is a guy who loves his kids. He loves one enough to give him what he asks for, which, by the way, was not outrageous and unheard of behavior for a good Jewish father in those days. Though you and I may have heard otherwise elsewhere, Levine assures us that nobody is being insulted here. Nor should the father be embarrassed about his exuberant behavior when he flies down that road and flings his arm around his son's neck and covers his face with kisses. He's father to two very different young men. His relationship with each of them is unique. That's just the way it works. We know this, particularly if we have siblings. And he loves his other son, too, enough to go looking for him when he realizes that in his joy over recovering what he thought he had lost, he may well have lost what he momentarily forgot that he had. Out there in that field is his firstborn, beneath whose anger lies the heartbreak of having been taken for granted. No one even told him about the party. Nobody thought to go find him when the fatted calf was being roasted and the best groom was being draped around his brother's shoulders. This father knows that in this moment the stakes are incredibly high not only for his relationship with this son who has always been with him, but also for the future of all three of them that lies beyond the frame of this story. Because reconciliation with this son, who now is in danger of being truly lost, is not a foregone conclusion. So what about this older brother, 
who reminds us of so many other older brothers in the scriptures, Cain, Esau, Ishmael, not to mention Joseph's 11 older brothers and David's six. Like them, he seems to be getting the short end of the stick. What if all these years he has been true to himself, just like his reckless, adventurous younger brother? What if he has worked steadily beside his father because not only does he love the farm, but he also loves his dad? What if he isn't the self-righteous, salvation-earning, looking down on that wayward brat caricature that has become standard fare in the interpretations of this parable? What if the last thing he would have wanted to be is a one-dimensional cardboard representative of all who play by the rules? What if he, like his father and his younger brother, is a flesh and blood human being just like you and I, who is both strong and weak, hopeful and foolish, beautiful and broken. My sisters and brothers, as I listened to the stories last Thursday night at Holy Spirit and to all of the many responses I was having to this story through the week, I realize that what this parable may actually be doing is holding up this mirror for all of us. A mirror that reflects the complexity and the mystery and the possibility and generosity of the human heart. Jesus is showing us in these three characters what it means to be in relationship with family, and with others that God sends to us. I, and I imagine most of you, have been all three of these people. I've been lost, sometimes by choice, but just as often not. We all get lost, separated, alienated from one another for a whole host of reasons, and I've been found. Thanks be to God, welcomed home with unexpected and undeserved grace, and even blessed enough to have been part of some other people's homecoming. And I stood out there in that field with my arms crossed over my chest because I've been good and nobody noticed. And I've stood with a beloved older brother grieving over not having been weeping with him and hoping that he'll come back. The thing is, reconciliation, which is what I believe is the object of this story, is hard work. It's as hard as going home under a cloud and admitting that we have failed. It's as hard as putting ourselves out there and exposing our hearts, hoping that they won't get broken. It's as hard as going after the one that we know we've hurt and facing their anger. It's as hard as learning that love, love that is real, that is of God, as the Apostle Paul tells us, keeps no record of wrongs. It's as hard as asking forgiveness, knowing that it really is going to finally be up to the other. The good news is that God in Christ, as Paul told us this morning, has reconciled the world to God's self, and that you and I have been given this ministry of reconciliation. Yes, the risks are great, but the grace is greater still, because on the other side of reconciliation is that party celebration where all are welcome and where everyone eventually shows up. We live in the hope that all God's children 
who were lost will be found. And all who were dead will come back to life. And that no one will miss it. This is the promise. This is God's desire for all of us and for this world that God so loves. So the question is, can this parable help us do this? Can it help us get there? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.